Have, I hope you're having a good day. I am David Scare, a professor, a teacher of, Old Te of New Testament and dogmatic theology here at Concordia Theological Seminary. And the lesson we're going to use is the fifth chapter of James. I will pr begin with providing some autographic, autobiographical uh, material. And that is, it was ever my intention to get into depth into the New Testament. And it was never my intention to get into the book of James. But about uh, five, six years into the seminary, an administration took over that took the, uh, that, so that I was no longer teaching courses in dogmatics, but I was teaching one course in Lutheran Confessions five or six times, seven times a, a year, and the Epistle of James of which I did not know anything. And so an instructor, in this case, gives assignments to students to deliver papers, and that covers the time. Well, uh, the first thing you had to do was go to Luther, and Luther had very little use for James. In fact, it would be better if Luther was never consulted on James, because uh, his what he says is contradictory, and it's not helpful at all. Now, the, one of the things we, uh, we don't like to get into uh, isagogics or the origin of the documents, but in this case, it's important for understanding it because uh, some, they're, by the way, from my studies in James, eventually a book was produced and here it is, James the Apostle of Faith, and it's available from Wipf and Stock in Eugene, Oregon, and be very helpful in Bible classes and also in preaching, at least I hope so. Concerning how I got into James, uh, my memoirs are being written at the present time, and I will explain that. Uh, and that is, it's not so much that God leads us, but he puts up barriers, and these barriers put us in other directions. Now getting into James. One of the things that's striking about James, it sounds, it, it sounds, it appears almost like the Sermon on the Mount. It is almost as if somebody took, as if the Sermon on the Mount was a beautiful ceramic jar and someone came with a hammer and smashed it and you had all the pieces. Those pieces are James. I would put James shortly after the martyrdom of Stephen. The scholars think, some scholars hold it's a Jewish writing. Uh, its themes are not only Christian, but have their origin in the preaching of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason that it does not, doesn't resemble Paul too much, and that is Paul has not come into prominence in the church. So I would date James no later than the year 40 more than any other writing in the New Testament, besides the Gospels, of course, it breathes the air of Jesus, uh, his, uh, his culture, his language, the way he expressed himself. The author, James, and there are six, uh, six possibilities, James, the brother of the Lord, James, the son of Alphaeus, James, the son of Zebedee, or three people pretending to be those three people, and that gave you to be six. Um, the language of James is agricultural, is very similar to that of Jesus. So let's just look at this, uh, the first chapter, I mean the first verses, verses one to six. One to six d does not really fit into the flow of the epistle. I believe they call it an apostrophe in which the preacher, and by the way, this is a sermon, uh, addresses a group which is not in the church. And um, the, the target of this vitriolic section happens to be the rich people, or rich people in general. Uh, so it starts off, now you rich people weep and tear and cry uh, concerning the, the destruction is coming uh, your wealth has uh, been corrupted and your silver is rotten. 
and this will be used as a judgment against you. And on the last day, um, it'll, it'll, it'll serve as a witness. It'll be burned by fire. And everything that you have treasured up for the last days. Now this reflects the eschatological tone of the preaching of Jesus. But one of the reasons Jesus does not speak on the doctrine of justification of faith, because the doctrine of justification by faith has to do with the present situation in, of, in which the believer finds himself. Jesus didn't do this because he understood who he was, that the next day was going to be the judgment and there would be no time to change your mind and repent. Now this is kind of strange for us because so many of the members of our congregations have family members uh, who, are not, who do not belong to the church. And we know the situation of our church that many of our, that most of the average membership member, I think is around 55 to 65 years of age. And their adult children are not going to church. And any suggestion uh, to our members that these people are gonna stand in the way in the day of judgment and be held accountable is completely not allowed. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a perversion of the Lutheran belief that there's going to be a deathbed conversion. And uh, in speaking to people who are uh, pastors who are engaged in hospice situations, it just doesn't happen. Uh, the thief on the cross type of conversion, which is held up as an example of what can happen in reality does not happen. So what we have here, by the way, is a speech about everything that uh, you could say against secularism. Now, secularism is an overused word. It, uh, uh, philosophically, it means that we understand all of life within the terms of this world, um, that there is no afterlife and there is no accountability. What you see, is what you get, that's what it is. And um, James in verses one to six, he is not speaking to anybody in the congregation. Now there are people in the congregation of some wealth. Uh, the epistle um, is, is, is addressed, as we're gonna see that soon, is addressed to um, uh, those Christians who have fled Jerusalem and it's described in the book of Acts after the martyrdom of Stephen. And it has to do with it. The, the, the cause for this, by the way, is the persecution of the church by Saul. And the Christians have left Jerusalem just for the sake of their own lives in seeing that Stephen was stoned. And up to that time, there was a fluid relationship between the church and the synagogue and the reason that Paul could go into the houses where the Christians were, and that means the synagogues, is that he, he, he attended worship. I mean, he was a kind of a spy of what was going on. And uh, anybody who has lived through the Nazi days, and more recently, the days of the Soviet Union, that they would put, the regimes would send people into the congregations to recognize who was, who was a Christian so that they could be persecuted. Now last uh, spring, I saw a motion picture on Richard Warbrandt, who was in prison for 17 years by the communist authorities in Romania for, uh, for not revealing the names of his Lutheran congregation. So persecution is very real. Now this is a kind of a strange concept uh, for, uh, for our people because uh, we have bought into the gospel of prosperity and I'm not so sure I would use that term prosperity or well, gospel of superiority, prosperity in a sermon because it has already been used so much that uh, it is becoming cliche. But uh, what that means is that believing in Christ and going to church is a good way of improving uh, your lifestyle, your way of life, your income, and your social status. That's the issue. Now, I'm not so sure that the churches that promote that are themselves 
prospering, but certainly it has been part of the American way of thinking that Christianity is the way to do it. Now, what you have here, uh, it almost borders on an orang because it's, it speaks about it speaks about men, if you could, a good union sermon here. It speaks about uh, landowners who are not paying their, their workers uh, their wage. You know, I think we've all encountered that kind of a situation. And we want to look at this. Uh, the reward of your workers in verse 4 over here. The work of your, the reward of your workers, by the way. Uh, this is coming to the ears of the Lord, of the Lord of hosts. Now, whether you want to develop that as a theme uh, in the sermon, I do not know. I waited on tables and the tips were frequently given to the um, head waiter or to the management, and I'm not so sure we ever got the tips that were intended by the customers to come to us. And there certainly are enough stor stories of people coming in from other countries, working in households, and not getting a, a decent wage of the, the money which they have learned. Now that's the problem. This really is the social gospel. Now, apparently, these people who are doing this are, are living on a very high scale. They're the upper class, and they have taken care of themselves. And um, uh, he's <laughs> it's a kind of a sense of humor in this, in this in this. He says they have fattened themselves up for that's in verse. Um, five and six, they have fattened up their hearts uh, for the day of judgment. I kind of like that, that uh, they'll, they'll just be better roasting material for the, when God comes in judgment on the day of judgment. And then comes verse, see Luther uh, did not think that this was an overly Christological epistle. I think he was totally wrong. It says over here, you condemned, you persecuted the righteous one, and he did not resist, resist you. Now, you know that in the early preaching of the church, the book of Acts, Jesus is presented by the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, as being the righteous or the just man. So, um, this phrase could, I think it kind of suggests it's being directed to the Jewish population, the upper class, uh, who were responsible for the trial, the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus. He did not, he did not resist you. So there is the, the, the Christological motif, the idea of, um, not paying uh, the field workers, the harvesters, the wage that is due certainly fits in with Jesus' parables about, uh, well, they're agricultural parables. A certain man went out to sow seed, and then comes the harvest, and some harvest is preserved by God, and some harvest is turned into the fire. That type of thinking is in there. Now, in verse seven, we uh, we move at this point over here. We move back into the congregation. So this part of the this here is addressed in a general way to the general population. We can't speak of the general population because. Um, they were all Jewish. And the Christians and the Jewish communities knew what the other was doing. So we're not dealing with uh, groups that 
Now, we don't know if you have a synagogue in town we, in your, where you live. I mean, that is, that's an entirely different situation. We don't know that. But at this time, the Christian congregations are beginning to emerge. And, um, and so uh, James, and I believe he's the brother of the Lord, he is the oldest son of Mary and Joseph. Um, quite, he's very erudite. He takes the leadership in the early church, and he himself is um, killed by a mob, probably in the in the early 60s, and he apparently got along very well with the leading Roman authorities. And when they were out of town, uh, the, a Jewish mob killed him. So you you get that reflection. Now, you, when you take the first four, six, the first six verses here of James, you don't want to get into the question of looking for law and looking for gospel. That, that simply is not there. Um, if you intend uh, to preach against society, this is what you have to do. I think this is a marvelous picture of society because there's one thing that, uh, there's one thing that keeps away people from the church and that is the pursuit of money and pleasure. And you know that every, every, every Sunday. St. Paul said that the love of money is the root of all evil. Jesus said it too about not laying up for yourselves um, treasures on earth where moth and rust does corrupt, but lay up self your treasures in heaven. The concept of moth, uh, uh, moth and rust corrupting is found in the first six verses. Now, in, seven, in the seventh verse, he, he moves the discussion. And by the way, I know in homiletics they tell you to use a trans, transitional sentence. I'm not so sure about that. When you're finished with a topic, you're finished with the topic, and everybody knows exactly what you said. And notice, by the way, here he calls his addressees brothers. It's a, it's a very, it's almost a falling thing. Put your anger on the back burner until the aparousia of the Lord. Now that's good. Uh, First Thessalonians language, uh, the parousia of the Lord. I guess in one sense it refers to the last day. But, um, I wonder if it has reference to the Holy Communion. I love that phrase, macrothemio, be patient. It really means, let your anger simmer down. Therefore, brothers, until the appearance of the Lord. Now, you know the situation in the early church, that the martyrdom of Stephen was a huge disappointment. And they, they, they took the words of Jesus very seriously that he was going to return. And it says here in verse, the end of verse 7, it says here, Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Now here comes this word patience again of letting your angers uh, cool down for a while. This word is the same word used in John by Jesus of himself. Now, you do know that the, uh, old, that the young prince in the British royal family is George. There's your term, George, right there. Gay or gas. Gay us, earth. Erge, a worker. A worker, George means a farmer a worker of the earth. Behold, the worker is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. This, it, this seems to be completely dependent on the parable of a sower who went out to sow seed. And uh, then in Mark you have it, by the way, the guy goes to sleep and he wakes up. And he wonders why it's growing and so forth. And, of course, if you're given statistics to fulfill as a pastor, which I don't believe in, uh, you're going to be very concerned 
about the number of baptism confirmations, adult acquisitions. Here it says, behold, the, the worker of the earth waits for the precious fruit. Now here is your doctrine of the atonement because the word tamawo, uh, right here, timion, means precious. It means price. It's the same word as price. So you have been bought by a price, by the precious blood of a lamb. So this harvest has been purchased. This is, you see, when you come to the scriptures, uh, they're written in a figurative way. You can use the term allegorical. I'm not afraid of that word. Because that's the way Jesus spoke in the parables. That's what they are, figurative language, parabolic language. And whoever wrote this was a, had actually heard the preaching of Jesus and had brought that into his own. And then he says, um, be patient, establish your hearts, for the parousia of the Lord is near. Now notice, this phrase is repeated again. Parousia to Kiryu. It's the same as this one. Parousia to Kiryu. It speaks about the day of judgment. And here, it, is, it certainly is, has a theme which is picked up in Thessalonica, to the, in the first epistle to Thessalonica that the day of the Lord is, is near. And it, says, it basically means it's suck it up because no matter what you're suffering, um, uh, the day of judgment is coming very quickly. And then in verse 9, do not go against one another because the judge is standing at the door. I love that phrase. Now, you know, here comes Book of Revelation, a famous painting in St. Paul's in London of Jesus standing at the door. You might have that painting in your house. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's the same thing. Found in the Book of Revelation, it's found here. It's also found in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is the door. You see, when, you, when you're speaking in figurative language, you switch back and forth. Now, you might, not be, you might not be able to speak like that. I'm not so sure I am. Um, but Jesus is about ready to enter the situation, and he will be the judge. Now, it's, I, I thought, I've always thought that the epistle of James is addressed to the clergy. Uh, uh, we, uh, the people expect the clergy to be willing to bear all things, all kinds of insults and so forth, and be happy all the time. I'm not so sure about that because it says in verse 10, follow the example brothers, against notice these are Christians, brothers, uh, consider, you got the word makrothemia again. Boy, does he love that word. Where is that word? Uh, here we go. Makrothemia. It's the third time it's used. It's used here. It's used there. It's used someplace else. Consider the patience. Uh, uh, consider the patience of the prophets. And you could translate this. Uh, consider the consider the depressed there you got the word kakopathea where is that word kako? oh here it is you want to use manic depressive kako bad pathia your emotions consider the uh, uh, consider how the preachers or the prophets were depressed. Those, and then can we get another phrase in here? This is all great stuff. The prophet who spoke, really preached in the name of the Lord. Now, 
Luther says it doesn't say much about Jesus. Luther, if he were alive, it could be suggested to him that he might want to uh, reconsider what he said. In, who preached, it looks like this is the beginning of the sermon. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They preached in the name of the Lord. If we can follow Dr. Gieschen, this is the name which Jesus revealed. Or it means that they stood in the place of Jesus. Um, they had a bad time. Now here, does prophets refer to Old Testament prophets? Or does it refer to preachers? Because in the Gospel of Matthew, it speaks about sending out prophets sending out preachers. The early term for a clergy person, the term for a, in the early church, was a prophet, one who proclaims. So it might refer to the martyrdom which the pastors themselves had endured. Um, and you wonder if they were all celebrating, if they were already celebrating saints' days, because here, we bless. That is the first word of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Bless, we bless those who are patient. Here, the, now Job is held up as an example. So whoever wrote this knew the story of Job, knew that his trials were intolerable, and yet he toughed it out. Um, for the uh, for you know the end of the Lord, for you know for you for you know the end of the Lord. That's very the end. You, you know the, where we are right over here. You know the purpose of the Lord. You know the purpose of the Lord. Tell us the goal to which it is going. You know. You see. You know because He, the Lord. See, this has to be a reference to Jesus because he is poly much compassion and he is oik tirmon. He is full of tears. I love that, by the way. He is tearful. The Lord is tearful. It's, it, it, certainly, uh, it certainly reflects Jesus crying over Jerusalem. I think this is one of the greatest statements on Christology on the person of Jesus in the entire New Testament. Because our point in preaching is not to preach doctrines, but actually to preach the person of Jesus. He is full of compassion and his eyes, his eyes are full of tears. Now, in verse 12, we're moving over into a new section. This has to do, this section here has to do with the preacher and Jesus. What's the relationship between them? It's extremely Christological. Now, James is getting towards the end of the epistle. Um, at least uh, when I was growing up, my father was a pastor. We never had any announcements in church. I think the proper place, about now by the way, the announcements come uh, before the liturgy begins, the pastor gives the announcements, runs to the back church, and then processes in, however he does that. What happens here, by the way, this is a, our New Testament writings are really sermons, and they have this type of oral quality about them. They were intended not to be read in private, as we read the scriptures now, but to be read out aloud. And that is a great skill to read the scriptures in an acceptable way. And I have my concerns and doubts about whether lay people should do it because we who are trained in the scriptures, in not only English, but also in Greek, Hebrew, uh, we don't always do it right. There is something, sometimes we read it dramatically, sometimes we scream it, something is lost. Um, but there has to be announcements. There has to be a church bulletin. I know one pastor I'm very close to. Service is supposed to begin at 
He's not through with the announcements until quarter of 10. But there have to be announcements. The, the announcements really should come at the end of the sermon. You could say, well, having a coffee after church and getting ready for BBS and having the altar guild meet and having the grounds committee meet and the elders meet. Well, that's not really church work, but it is church work. That is an extension of what we're doing in the church. So here now at the end of the epistle of James comes these beautiful announcements or things that we didn't that we didn't include, that we should have included someplace else. Well, none of us really have that kind of a mind that we put everything in the right place or the most logical place. So here you go. Um, okay, in verse 12, don't swear. Don't do it by heaven or by the, don't do it by the earth because that's the foot. So let's say yes and no. Now this does, this should not be an opportunity for a sermon on using foul language. At least in certain places, and you've been there, as much as I have been there, like people who work in the old kind of garages, people who work in some kinds of agriculture, they got some kind of a vocabulary that if they were in ordinary business, it wouldn't be allowed. That had, this section here about not swearing has nothing to do with that at all. There's something to do with breaking uh, the second commandment. So don't go into that. And it means like this. Okay, you're not going to swear by the name of God. In the name of God, I'm going to get that guy. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. You, you, it says that you should not use God as your witness. It says simply say, Yes and no. And the reason is that we Christians are always standing before the judgment seat of God. And we don't, this is not like a courtroom where you where the, tell the whole truth, so help you God. That's not kind of situation. Because the Christian is aware that every time he is speaking, he it says right here, by the way, um, it says, just say yes and just say no. And don't say, by my mother's grave, uh, this is the truth. Don't, don't any kind of uh, an oath in that way is allowed. Um, now comes yesterday. We had the advantage of hearing a gal with doxology uh, speak to the faculty. I found it very interesting. I have not. Been, I have not been involved in that in any way at all. Sounds like a marvelous program. But there are, oh, she spoke about, we speak, we speak about IQs. Now there are EQs. Uh, I'm not sure I got that right. Emotional quotients. In other words, we're all different. We have all different intelligent levels. We also have um, different emotional levels. And I think this is very important for a pastor to recognize this in himself and also to recognize it in his parishioners. It says around here, if anybody is depressed, 13, verse 13, kakopathe. Among you, so it's written to the whole church, let him pray. If he is over enthusiastic, and I think this is a I think this is a reference to people who are borderline charismatics. We're going to have these people who are absolutely aglow with faith and so forth. Everything in their life is good and happy. He says here, let them join the choir. Um, let them sing right over here. Uthameo. Whoever wrote this had an insight into how, it, what kind of human beings we all are. If anybody is sick among you, let him call the elders of the church. Now on this one, and let him pray. And uh, as they pray, put oil in him. Here comes the phrase again, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer 
of faith will say, uh, the person who's got a hot fever, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, uh, from trying to, you know, there, there are these religious groups who do not engage in, um, who, who do not allow any medical intervention. And it is common, too, that if someone gets sick, cancer, something seriously, well, you know, that person, that's, that's his just reward. He's a sinner. He shouldn't have done that. A student, and I, he worked with, he was a, a lieutenant in the Indiana State Police. And he had the job of notifying the deceased of people who were killed in car accidents. And I asked him, what's the reaction when you go to the door? The reaction is, I told him or her that he should not do that. So we see these things in life as penalties for our own situations. Now, if you step out in front of a speeding car, I'm not so sure that that's a penalty. That's a somewhat of a lack of awareness. But I love this passage. Because the pastor is going to face this kind of a question. There'll be a, a situation. He will have hypochondriacs in his congregation. This is the person who is always calling up for whatever and ever, for every little thing. And in some churches, there's so many people sick and on the sick list, there are more people on the sick list than there are in the congregation for Sunday worship. So what exactly does this mean? if anybody is sick. You will notice that the word for sick over here is the same word for an oven. It means somebody who has got a fever. That's what it means. Now, uh, mo most of you, all of you, have had children. And uh, there's a certain, okay, the kid has 100, 101, 102. Holy smokes, you better head for the bathtub and put ice in there and get that fever down. Because fever, fever brings on death. It's a sign of death. That's the first thing that has to be. So if anybody is, is near to death, let him call the elders. Now, if there ever has been a misinterpretation of a word, it will be... Uh, let us see, where does it say, let them call the elders? Uh, oh, here it is. Let them call the elders of the church. Now, this does not refer to any group in our congregations called the elders. This is the term, the word presbyteros, which is the Greek word there, is the, is the forerunner of our word priest. Let him call the clergy. The clergy should, should only be called when there is a real, not a cold, something that's going to bring on death. And, uh, and the question here is whether um, automatically, if, he, if the person who is sick does this, um, that the Lord will immediately relieve. It doesn't say that. Here, the word agairo, is the term for resurrection. The Lord will resurrect him. And so the promise here is that the person who is sick unto death should receive receives the promise that Jesus will raise him up on the last day. I love this section, by the way, very much. You got people who are depressed. You got people who are over enthusiastic and they can be a little they can be a little bit unnerving and then the third category is you got a person who is really sick unto death and uh, <laughs> I just I know I I succeeded a pastor that if someone was in the hospital the members of the congregation who were if his family had to go and see the pastor and make an appointment to go to the hospital. No, we have to be ready to go right then and there. 
And so these are just little items tucked, tucked in at the end of the sermon. It says here, if, uh, if, he's, if a person stops sinning, it will be forgiven. Confess your sins to another and pray in behalf of one another and you will be healed. Yes, I think this refers to an activity in the congregation. Now, we have a very formalized liturgical system of confession and absolution. Um, but the, here, it's, here it says you're supposed to do this not to the clergy person confessing your sins, not private confession, but you should confess if you've offended somebody, you should confess it to the person whom you have offended. That's what it says here. Now we have a uh, we have a revival of that promise, by the way, in the greeting of peace. Um, we are so used, you know. I can't ask that gentleman for forgiveness. We're going to ask God for forgiveness, because all sin is against God. So I'm going to confess my sin to God. Okay, that's fine. But here it says quite clearly, confess your sins. Uh, to one another. And it says, and you will be healed. This is, this sounds like Isaiah. And with his stripes, we are healed. That healing here is not reference to physical healing, but the healing of forgiveness, the healing of recon reconciliation. Now, where is this word? Right here. He shall be healed right here and the prayer of a righteous man accomplishes it very much now i don't know who here i have to go back and see what i i once held about this position the prayer of a righteous man availeth much is this the christian is this uh, stephen is this job i think Uh, accomplishes much. Now, here it goes in verse 17. I love 17. I think this is a classic. This is this if a sermon on, on James, if it's to pre be preached anyway, anywhere, it should be preached to the Sunday morning, out uh, to the Monday morning, Monday morning Winkle uh, conference. It's really for a pastoral. It says here, Elijah was a, a man of similar passion like us. He prayed a prayed for not prayer to pray. He prayed a prayer not to reign or did not reign on the earth for three, for three months, for three weeks, and oh, three years and six months. And again, he prayed and the heavens were opened and the earth brought forth his fruit. I like this very much because if, you know, part of being a Lutheran pastor is being depressed because things just do not turn out the way they were promised. Elijah was an anthropos, a human being. How do you like that word? of a similar passion as we are. And that he was no different than, and it says, it says that his prayers were eventually, so you have here a sermon on prayer. Um, now verse 19, you're getting, we're getting to back down to the very gritty end. Now my brothers, if one of you, this is why I think it's written to the clergy. If one of you strays from the truth and someone turns him around, know that the one who turns him around from his sinful way saves his soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. Um, misunderstandings, false teachings, comes with the term. There's never going to be a pure, dead, orthodox church. There's never going to be a church where all the clergy are right down the line. And here, and, and he's referring here to uh, 
preachers who have gone astray. And it says you have an obligation to point out this, this guy where he's gone off the deep end and to bring him back. And then it concludes you'll cover a multitude of sins. Does that mean? Is this some kind of work righteousness? That if I do this, if I actually correct something, but we're using correct. <laughs> Dude, that, that doesn't go over. We have enough people around here correcting other people. That's, oh, you, no, no. If you help that guy to see how things should be said and done, then you're covering a multitude of sins. Now, is this some kind of self-righteous work that I'm contributing to my own salvation by um, showing the fellow the error of his ways? No. It means this. We've learned, we've learned this, that pastors are extremely influential people in the lives of people. It doesn't take too long for one pastor to take the whole flock off on a tangent. We've lost congregations to the Missouri Synod because some guy had a fly in the pocket and he just wouldn't get it out. He was obsessed with the, what, with the way things should be. And so you had a number of things. People left, uh, did not left, left the church. Maybe he went to another church or no church at all. Or maybe he took the entire congregation over to another, another fellowship. If you can stop this, if anybody can stop this, you've covered a multitude of sins. Um, I hope my enthusiasm for the epistle of James came out in this short time that we have with one another. If you want to, if you want to know more, you can get this book from Wiffenstock, James the Apostle of Faith. How do you like that title? He is the one who introduced the doctrine of justification by faith. He saw justification the way Jesus did, the day of judgment. Now we're going to do this when it comes into Advent in a couple of months, several months, that Jesus is standing at the door. But in all of our preaching, it is the concept of judgment. And I do not find James turgid. Uh, this year, sometime before the end of the school year, I'm going to be teaching another seminar in James, and I'm looking forward to it. And even though I've been doing it for maybe close to 50 years, I love it even more, and I always find something that I didn't see before. So I hope you can see, I hope you enjoyed the Epistle of James and find out these golden nuggets for yourself. Thank you very much.